this was once the edge of a great empire, where the Romans built a wall to mark the boundary between their civilization and the barbarians. It was the Emperor Antoninus Pius who ordered its construction, and it was the men of the Second Legion who built its final section, which ended at Bones on the Firth of Forth. They left behind a distance slab, a stone tablet, to commemorate their work. Here, the Second Legion had built a total of 4,652 pieces of wall, but the slab marking their achievement vanished in the mists of history and was only rediscovered at Bridgeness in 1868. Now, an exact full-size replica has been made using the latest cutting-edge technology. And when the modern-day computer-assisted stonemasons finished, the new stone was re-erected near the original line of the Antonine Wall. The mark of Rome is there for all to see, just as the Second Legion had planned. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Antonine Wall was the northwest frontier of the Roman Empire. It was built by the Roman army in the years following AD 140 on the orders of the Emperor Antoninus Pius. It ran for 40 Roman miles, that's about 65 kilometres, from Old Kilpatrick on the River Clyde to modern Bones. The legionnaires were proud of their work. They inscribed their details and dates of the sections they had built on a series of slabs or stone tablets. Twenty of these have been found, each recording the name of the emperor, the legion concerned, and the distance constructed. But the largest and finest of the tablets was found at Bridgeness. The Roman conquest of Britain was a gradual process, beginning effectively in AD 43 under Emperor Claudius. Hadrian's Wall, built during the years 122 to 130, during the rule of Emperor Hadrian, is 83 miles to the south and was the northern frontier of the Roman Empire. Hadrian's Wall stretched 73 miles from Wall's End on Time in the east to Bones, and that's Bones in Cumbria, Bones with a W, on the Solway Firth in the west. Hadrian's Wall was the most heavily fortified border in the empire. In addition to its role as a military fortification, it is thought that many of the gates through the wall would have served as customs posts to allow trade and to levy taxation. So, what drove the Romans to build a second line of defence, the Antonine Wall, across the narrow waste of Scotland? Antoninus Pius was the uh, successor to Hadrian um, in 138 AD, and he needed some kind of military victory and glory um, in order to maintain his uh, grip on power. Uh, so the natural thing to do was to advance into Scotland and to build a new frontier to replace Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall had been built in 122 AD onwards and was al already relatively famous. Uh, so by coming up here and building another very impressive frontier, um, he was able to keep his grip on the, on the throne um, and employ the soldiers. 
So around 142 AD, the Roman army came up here and started construction work uh, on a new unified frontier. Uh, different from Hadrian's Wall because most of it was built of turf and earth. Um, having said that, over a third of the Hadrianic frontier was not of stone in its original scheme. Three legions came up here in considerable strength uh, and they obviously surveyed the ground between the Clyde and the Forth and the most suitable place was the north facing slope that we see here. Uh, the wall is extremely well placed to dominate the landscape uh, and because of its massive scale of course it would have been a formidable barrier to movement from north to south. When it was imposed um, it would have been like the Berlin Wall where you would have had one family living on one side and perhaps members of the same family living on the other side of the wall. Uh, but there were fortlets every one mile along the wall. The nearest one is actually just at the back of the stable block at the end of the ditch here. Um, and they would have had access gates to allow people to come through. There were then 17 larger forts um, at roughly two mile intervals. Uh, the nearest one to here is Rough Castle. Uh, another one lies buried under the suburbs of Falkirk. And they would have held units of 500 or so men but they were auxiliaries. Um, the frontier that we see here was built by the legionaries and those were the citizens of Rome. They were trained, skilled craftsmen, um, both able to lay masonry buildings down, but also to undertake larger excavations such as this one. So this ditch would have been dug using entrenching tools, um, spades, and then throwing the earth into baskets and dragging it up the, the sides. Uh, most of the earth here is placed on the north side to create an even steeper access uh, from bar the barbarian side. The Romans had chosen the route of the Antonine Wall with skill and care. Later, part of the line of the wall was followed across the waste of Scotland by the builders of canals, of railways and of motorways. This part of the Roman frontier is known as Watling Lodge. The most obvious feature is the ditch in which I'm walking, which here is almost 16 feet deep, almost the original depth, and some 35 feet across at the top. To the south side of the ditch, on the rising ground up there, would have been the rampart itself, which would have been another 10 feet in height and 14 feet across. And it's the construction of the rampart which is commemorated by the distance stones such as the business tablet. The, the massive ditch some 38 miles in length was dug by legionaries um, and it's not surprising that they wanted to commemorate the massive scale of the work that they had undertaken. I mean this was the largest construction project in central Scotland until the building of the Forth and Clyde Canal in the 18th century. Um, so the distance stones commemorate the fact that individual units of the legions have made or constructed certain sections of the wall and that includes the ditch and the rampart itself. Uh, the distant stones would have been placed very conspicuously on the rampart up on the, the south side placed in a small section of wall um, overlooking both the enemy side the north side and the south side as well. In order to give you some idea of the dimensions of this monumental earthwork, we'll start by walking across the upcast mound and then come to the edge of the very steep ditch, quickly down, but much, much slower up the steep reverse slope, then across the berm, which is where the Roman minefield would have been. And here we have the round part, now only eight feet, originally 10. The Antonine Wall was a symbol of the golden age of the Roman Empire, one of the greatest states ever to have existed. At the height of its power, Rome ruled over 50 billion people scattered in over 5,000 administrative units. The wall was a silent but constant reminder of the sheer power of the Roman invaders, intended to impress and to overawe the local tribes. I'm standing on the west rampart of the Roman fort at Rough Castle, which has some of the best preserved earthworks along the whole of the Antonine frontier. 
Immediately behind me are the first two ditches of the defences, uh, with a third one part of the way down the hill. In the bottom of the valley, we have the Rowan Tree Burn, and beyond that, on the other side, on the horizon, you can see to the left the mound of the Antonine Wall itself, which here survives to a height of between six and eight feet. To the right of the rampart, again, another fine stretch of the ditch. Um, and this connects right through to the Antonine Wall on our left side, where there's an eight foot high stretch. The fort itself is much slighter earthwork, but you can still make out the defensive ditches and in the centre is the headquarters building. When they excavated the headquarters building back in 1900, they found an inscription in the entranceway uh, and the Latin on it mentions a specific building, the Principia, which uh, is the headquarters building itself. And that was a particular note back in 1900 because it was the first time that we realised that Principia was the Latin name for that central administration building. The building would have been very substantial with stone columns, maybe three storeys high, and with a basilical hall at the back. The inscription commemorates its construction by the auxiliary unit that was based here, and they obviously took a great pride in their work. They wanted to you know, show that they'd done this, and it's the same pride that is shown on the distance tablets for the construction of the linear wall itself by the legionaries. The Antonine Wall even had its own form of minefields to deter attackers. Here at Rough Castle in 1901, the archaeologists made a very unusual discovery. Um, looking at the difference in growth of vegetation, they found a series of small pits here on the north side of the Upcast Mound. Uh, originally they would have had wooden spikes in them with a, a sharpened end protruding upwards. Uh, the idea being that if you were walking across them you would end up skewering yourself on the wooden spike. The range such that uh, this pit covers the gap between the two pits uh, behind it and the two pits in front. So you can't just run across here, you'd end up uh, in one or other of the pits. So you can imagine with that being nice and sharp, walking across here skewering your foot on there, giving out a cry of pain, alerting the guards to your presence. And of course, within a few weeks, the wound that you'd receive would turn septic and you would die in agony. Um, so these pits are the Roman equivalent of a minefield. Um, and of course, they take less uh, troops to, to man the place and to defend it. So the form of passive defense. The Germans had them in the First World War. They call them wolf pits. Uh, and uh, we now know that, uh, in fact, the equivalent of these pits occur between the main ditch of the Antonine Wall and the rampart, and they're all 38 miles along the frontier. So they would have been part of the linear barrier, which is commemorated on the distance tablets. But greed and corruption caused the Roman Empire to collapse. The Antonine Wall was only occupied for about 20 years, a single generation, and then the frontier moved back to Hadrian's Wall. In AD 410, Roma withdrew from Britannia and the great defensive walls were left to decay. The Western Roman Empire collapsed in 476 as Romulus Augustus was forced to abdicate to the Germanic warlord Odoacer. The Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire ended in 1453 with the death of Constantine XI and the capture of Constantinople by the Ottoman Turks. About 1500 years after the legions had left the wall, the ghosts of the legionnaires were unearthed on a rocky promontory on which Bridgeness Tower now stands. The legionary tablet at, at Bridgeness was found by my great-grandfather in 1868. 
And my grandfather, who must have been quite a young man at the time, was actually present at the uncovering of the stone. The stone was supposed to have been found in someone's garden ground and they removed some topsoil, quite a, quite a little topsoil, and it revealed, revealed the stone. It was then, uh, this created a tremendous amount of interest, obviously, and uh, the, the two grandfathers gathered to, uh, presumably with a workforce of people, to help them lift this large stone out of the ground. Uh, a very, very exciting event um, in Burness at that time. My grandfather gives a personal account of this uh, in his book, The Story of the Fourth, um, and he records in that that uh, the, the stone was then removed to, uh, on a temporary basis, to the Old Grange Garden, uh, to a place of safety, if you like, and a place where it could be recorded and where it could be revealed to those people who were better informed about its history. Uh, and it was, it was put up in the Old Grange Garden. There is a very interesting uh, photograph of the old gardener, Adam Stanners, uh, taken in at the same date, 1868, standing behind the stone in the Old Grange Garden uh, and uh, an early photograph uh, really demonstrating the, uh, the wonder and excitement of the event. Uh, quite, quite an amazing event for, uh, for that part of Bowness or that part of Scotland at that particular moment. Within a few years, uh, Cadell commissioned uh, a facsimile of the inscription to be made, and we see it here um, embedded in this wall. The size replicates that of the original stone, but uh, we've lost the, the two decorative panels on either side. The original reports say that the curb stones here were found in the immediate vicinity of the stone tablet, and that they form part of the Antonine Wall. Uh, the problem was there was no indication of the orientation of the wall that had been discovered and it was only in 1985 when further excavation work was done that we found that that wall was at right angles to the wall that we now see and therefore cannot have been the Antonine Wall. Uh, the original reports also tell us that the tablet was found some three feet above the windstone natural. Uh, the 1985 excavation found that the curb stones were lying directly on the natural and therefore it, we can conclude from that that the stone was not in a Roman position. Um, it was dumped there in the late medieval period and we have to assume uh, that it was brought from a location on the wall itself uh, for reuse, um, perhaps in the windmill at Bridgeness Tower immediately behind us here. The Bridgeness tablet was found some 30 feet behind this wall uh, and the replica was put um, bordering the, the public road so that the people can, can see it. The new replica will be placed in a public park where it will be far more accessible. A special plaque was built near where the slab was found and states that the slab was discovered near this spot on the 29th of April 1868. The original had been presented to the Museum of Antiquities in Edinburgh, the forerunner of today's National Museum of Scotland. Experts of the day also speculated that the name of the closely adjoining property of Keneal comes from the Gaelic, meaning the head of the wall. got in the centrepiece of it the inscription which dedicates the work by the army to the emperor. You have the record of the building of 4,652 paces of the wall by the second legion. You've got a sacrifice scene. So within the, the architecture of a temple, the arch top of a temple, you have figures standing there. And in the back you have three soldiers um, holding a a flag with the flag of the legion and in front of them stands the commander in a toga and he's making the sacrifice 
pouring a sacrifice out on an altar. In front of that, the animals which are due to be sacrificed, a cow, a pig and a sheep. And to one side, a guy playing musical instruments to drown out the sounds of the sacrifice, drown out the sounds of the animals as they're killed. On the other side, the left side as you look at it, is if you like the propaganda view of the conquest of Roman Scotland. Because what you see here is the Roman cavalrymen riding down these naked barbarians, sticking a spear in the back of one of them, one of them's captured, his hands tied, one's already been decapitated. It's a very brutal view of war on the frontier. On closer examination, the stone gave up another secret. Well, the, the slab came to the museum in 1869, only a few months after its discovery, and it's been on display in the various incarnations of the museum ever since. But it was only in 1978, when we were preparing for a new exhibition in our old building in Queen Street in Edinburgh, that the stone was washed. And what the washing did was it brought to life the surface of the stone. So whereas it previously had all looked a fairly grey-brown colour, with the, the water on it, suddenly some of the very, very fugitive colour became apparent. And you could see traces of red in the lettering and traces of colour on the cloak of the rider. And you could also see, um, rather brutally, traces of red paint marking blood on the head and the neck of one of the decapitated figures. It makes you think, of course, how would the slab once have looked? Because that's one of the colours we can see. And presumably, the whole slab was once coloured, or large parts of the slab were once coloured. Now, red often survives quite well as a colour. Um, there's hints of, I think it's blue, or possibly blue on the, or grey on the horse and on the, the rider's face. But we can suggest that most of the sculpture would have been painted. So the whole thing would have been, not the, the grey-brown thing you see now, but technicolour, you know, really quite vibrant when you first saw it. In recent years, Oness had become more and more aware of the importance of the bridge nest slab, especially after the Antonine Wall was designated a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 2008. It was back in 2002 when Ken Wright, another community councillor, and I were working on a project with Bonnie Boness, uh, creating some trails in and around Boness. One of those trails was um, Bridge Ness. The Bridge Ness slab was an obvious historical landmark, um, but the existing one built into the wall in Harbour Road was woefully inadequate. It was badly weathered, almost unreadable, and only showed the centre panel of the slab. We knew that the original was held at the museum, the National Museum of Scotland in Chamber Street in Edinburgh. It was then that we had the idea that we should um, contact the museum and ask if we could have the slab returned to its rightful home in Bonesse. They didn't exactly laugh at the idea, but they, needless to say, the request was dismissed as they explained the importance of the slab in the history of the Romans in Scotland. Um, the idea for the, the, um, the Bridge Ness uh, slab replica project first came to my notice from the Community Council when they made a, an approach to the Council for assistance to deliver what uh, they consider to be an important local heritage initiative. Um, the initiative fitted well with the Council's aspirations in terms of its built heritage strategy and um, in recognition of our recently designated World Heritage Site, the Antonine Wall. So the Council was very uh, keen to become involved in this project, uh, particularly when it was um, generated by the community and support supported from the community itself. But it was felt that the slab was too valuable to return to the town. The slab is one of the most important pieces of sculpture from Roman Britain. It's not just of Scottish importance, it's of international importance. And that's what the landowner realised when he gave the slab to the museum in the 1860s. And it's been on display ever since. It's one of the key display items in our collections. If you're telling the story of Roman Scotland, the bridge nest slab is one of the absolutely fundamental things to tell it by. So here it's telling part of the national story of the Romans in Scotland. And that's why we think it's a fundamental part of the displays here. local councillors were not put off and came up with an alternative plan. If they couldn't get the original, they would settle for an exact copy. Once it was clear um, we weren't going to get the slab back as such, we then agreed that creating a replica would be this, the next best step. And as I said, the National Museums were very supportive. 
They also said that they had a, another replica which was in the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow which you could probably make a copy from. And we investigated that. We took it back to the, the Community Council and they all agreed that we should pursue the idea of creating this replica. The designation of the Antonine Wall as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in July 2008 added to the determination to see the Bridgeness slab recreated. Bowness Community Council was successful in raising the funds which were used to finance the design and project management. The digital scanning and manufacture of the full-size facsimile in sandstone and the construction of display and interpretation areas for visitors. While the search went on for a suitable stone, experts at Historic Scotland were preparing to use special 3D computer scanning equipment to obtain an exact copy, cracks and all, of the original stone. We have a history within the Department of uh, Replication of historic elements of buildings, usually architectural, sculptural parts. And these are uh, replicated usually so that they can be removed from uh, the external environment where they may be suffering from uh, stone decay or the effects of uh, other environmental issues, as well as human issues like vandalism. It's more often than not been a traditional casting method that we've uh, pursued to create these replicas, which means creating traditional moulds from, from the surfaces. Laterally, this has been using uh, synthetic materials such as uh, silicon rubbers, which are applied to the surface and can then be removed and create the, the actual kind of surface onto which fibreglass or uh, resins or plasters are then filled or poured. The Downside to that, whilst they are very high detail in terms of the replication process, they uh, do require the surface to be physically touched or materials applied to it. And in some cases where there's uh, vulnerable or friable surfaces, that can be detrimental to the uh, substrate. As a result of the technology that's now developed with scanning and 3D printing, that now provides the opportunity to have a non-contact version of uh, this process. So with the Bridgeness slab, uh, something of that scale is really pushing the boundaries for the close-range scanning that we do, uh, which is very high resolution, sub-millimetre. You could ask, well, why didn't we go down the route of uh, traditional moulding and casting? Really, because of contact with the surface, we simply wouldn't have got permission by the museum to have uh, applied for traditional mould making of the surface, given that it's in situ within the museum, and for fears of the surface being uh, pulled or, or elements of it being lost as a result of the uh, rubber being removed. So uh, non-contact replication is always going to be the, the only uh, likelihood and as uh, time has passed it meant that technology had got to the point nowadays where we can accurately record the surface in a detail that's comparable with uh, casting. The, the initial project was uh, a scouting mission to the museum where the stones presently held and uh, realising that there were a number of logistic issues that we would have to tackle in uh, the recording of it. Uh, one of those was the fact that it was immobile. Uh, it's, it's a large monument, but it's now built into uh, one of the walls in the, the lower level of the Museum of Scotland. Uh, and another issue was that it was uh, quite high. It's about six feet high off the ground. It's uh, also a large monument. It's uh, around about uh, nine feet by three feet. And 
as a result, really kind of pushing the limits of our close range uh, scanning technology, which is recording at submillimeter uh, densities. And the, the process really entails uh, working from a tripod, uh, and in this case, because the object was so high off the ground, uh, using step ladders to actually change the settings and the, the viewing angle of the uh, instrument as well. The laser scanning system works by the emission of a laser beam and the recording of its reflection to calculate a three-dimensional point in space. This is done thousands of times within the, the capture period to give a mesh overlay of the uh, three-dimensional surface. At this point, it's just uh, points in space, so not necessarily joined together. Uh, from that point, we then would move the scanner and uh, try to get something along the lines of a third of an overlap from one scan to the next, then rescan. That gives us two point clouds, which we then have to go back into the software and process over one another, registering them to one another so that the meshes fit as precisely as they possibly can. Uh, this enables the, the surface to be built up. Uh, the end result is something of a, a three-dimensional mosaic, if you like, which will eventually lead to the entire surface being recorded. Um, when looking for a, a, an end product that can be used for replication, uh, we have to then make that into what's called a, a watertight model, which means that it has uh, a back and sides put onto it. And uh, we do this again in the processing stage by uh, projecting points from the boundaries of the mesh and uh, surfacing these. So the, the end product that then goes to the, the CNC provider is a, a watertight uh, digital model which uh, can be put into their processing and uh, then is mapped out onto the stone using their uh, computer controlled uh, milling devices. At Bridge Nest, work was in progress to turn a corner of a damp field into a home for the new slab which would attract tourists. We've actually designed this small sitting uh, space, this public realm, for the site of the Bridge Nest Lab, um, which is close to where it was actually uh, found. It, um, it, it, it is a contemplative space, but it's very much an interpretive place uh, where visitors can come and, and, and actually understand what the Bridge Nest Lab is, is all about. Um, obviously, nearly 2,000 years old, um, uh, rehoused in a, in a location in a sense uh, that, that, that is very modern in, in, in landscape terms. It's a, it's a small project as far as we're concerned, but it's been a delight to be involved in it. Um, it's, it's about attention to detail and creating a, you know, a, a lovely setting for what is a, a, a wonderful historic monument. Quarry near Elgin in Murray, careful preparations were carried out to extract a sandstone slab which would double as the Bridge Nest tablet. We've been the operators of this quarry, the Clasher Quarry, uh, for two and a half years now. The quarry itself was founded uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, the stone itself is renowned for its qualities, the, the colour, the graining, the, the strength of this, and the durability of the stone, uh, which is one thing that makes this particular Clasher stone unique. I think it's, it, it is actually partly to do with the area that it comes from. I mean, obviously this comes from ancient deserts, 
uh, the seam stretches all the way out to Norway, uh, under the North Sea. Uh, We've actually had several drilling companies, they come to us asking for samples of the rock for, so they can test their, their cores or drilling uh, because it's such a hard, it's such a unique stone, it's so hard. Uh, and it's partly to do with the location, we think. It's just the weathering, really. This quarry's got two main, two main aims, really. One side is a dimensional stone, uh, which is what we produce, the paving slabs, blocks, uh, just general general block work out of but we also as a separate part of the business we have several aggregates uh, and from here we crush it down into a very hard wearing um, aggregate a chip which you can put in your driveways and paths uh, which is proving very popular so when we're extracting the stone we've got the larger stone which we use for dimensional purposes which is for the slab uh, and secondly the smaller stone instead of just wasting it or or leaving it to, to, to pile up in a mound, we can crush it down, so we also make use of that. So there's less waste overall. Well, we were approached well, possibly about a year ago now originally uh, with a request for information where the, originally the size of the stone would be available. Uh, tests had been done on the original slab, which indicated that the classic stone would be a, a good match for the original slab, which is why they came to us to see if they could source a replacement and if it would be available. When we first came in here two and a half years ago, uh, most of the quarrying that had been done was uh, quite hard blasting with uh, jelly uh, and dynamite basically. Uh, now that shattered a lot of the rock which is why the, the size and the scale of the rocks, the stones wasn't previously available. When we came in here we operated it a different way because we've got a quarrying background. Um, so we were able to, originally we thought about doing stitch drilling which is basically taking the rocks out individually like a postage stamp, so you're creating a seam and extracting the big rocks that way. But we found it was too time consuming for a quarry this size and what you were getting out of it, it was, it was too costly. Uh, so what we do is, a, we still do an element of blasting but it's a different type. The spacing from the drill in the holes to blast is a lot wider apart. And they're more, more shaking the stone loose. So from that you get the good sized blocks which don't have cracks or fractures through it, but you're also getting the smaller aggregates which we can use as well, as I said, to crush the stone down. So we're getting the two types of stone, still doing some blasting, but it's done in a different way, which is more beneficial for everyone. With this particular one, it's going to have to be cut more than likely on site here, using a wire saw that's taken in from a, another quarry we have. Uh, so it's, it's going to be more or less halved here on site, cut to a face. Once it's to a smaller size, then we can transport it to our other works where it can be cut down into the actual size it was required. Um, a lot easier to handle when it's a bit smaller. You know? um, and from there, we've got several primary saws in other works. Um, it will just get loaded onto them, cut to the size, and then we'll eventually finish it off from there. was set, the giant sandstone slab was blasted out of the earth. After the dust had settled, the slab was unearthed from the rubble and gently loaded onto a lorry for the journey south to a specialised firm of stonemasons at Thornhill near Stirling. Originally, architects had approached us um, asking whether it was possible to, uh, using modern equipment to replicate the slab, uh, we kind of tentatively agreed uh, or said that we, it could be done. Um, further discussions followed and eventually the project was awarded to us. Um, we had to wait a long time to get the stone itself from the quarry, it was quite a challenge to get the stone. And then when the stone eventually arrived, we set about milling it which is a process that we thought, well, we anticipated that it would take several days. It's turned out to take several weeks uh, and put, us, uh, put the machines and the people, everybody involved, not, not under pressure, but it's been a real challenge for them all. Um, now, it's been challenging because it's a one-off and we're having to work with uh, information that we weren't accustomed to working with. Often we just do a, a design ourselves 
and it goes to the machine and, and uh, we produce it from there. This time we've had this detailed information coming in in the form of the scan, which we've then had to take and turn into a programme that our machine follows. So that was the first part that was quite difficult. And then, given that this stone is quite a hard material, selecting the right tools to cut it and process it, ones that don't wear out and ones that are resilient enough to have very hard sandstone. And then it's just been the scale of this one is that it's not just a small item, it's a big, big piece of stone, bigger than we normally would process. And it's the challenge of having the, the machine working long periods of time. That puts the machine under a bit of stress and it means that we've got to just put a lot, of, a lot more time than we anticipated originally into it, but it's turned out okay. For the initial roughing out, we used um, a, a small blade uh, for the saw. That gets rid of, um, does what we call the donkey work. Uh, that was that initially stage one. Uh, stage two, we've now moved on to what we call a router. It, it basically just drills holes. And, and, and for maybe five or six hours, you won't see anything at all. Um, we've, finished that now and we're now going on to a, a smaller router that should bring out a lot more detail in the stone um, and then stage three is, is a standard finish. We'll then go from stage three to stage four which is a, a, a tiny piece of metal, it's only 2.5 millimetres wide, it's called a PCD and that's, that'll be to finish the stone, that's my part done. It then goes into the mason shed. at Bowness, work had started on preparing the new home for the new bridge nest slab. I used to live at the foot of Harbour Road and I always kept passing the stone and I noticed it was badly and needed repair. Well, I'm looking forward to see it. I think it would be good for the visitors of Bonnet to know it's there. Well, the original slab was uh, found in the 1860s and of course was given to the museum in Edinburgh and, and you can still go out and, and see it in the museum in Chambers Street. Um, but uh, what was put on display was uh, simply just some of the Latin text, it wasn't the whole slab. So I think people in Bowness, many people in Bowness have probably never seen the actual bridge nest slab and having a, a proper replica uh, on show in the town will really make people aware of the, the Roman history and the heritage they have in their area. Well, of course, as part of the, um, the education for primary school children, uh, children across Scotland learn about the Romans. And it's really exciting for children in Bowness to, to understand that the Romans were here in their town. They built a wall right across where they, they are. In fact, in some of the schools in Bowness, parts of the Antonine Wall go through the, play, the playing fields and the playgrounds. Um, and so for children to actually see something physical on the, on the ground that they can actually interpret like the, the replica of the slab is really important because it makes them more aware that the Romans were here in their community um, and, uh, and they were part of world history. Finally, the day arrived for the new stone to be set in place. We don't know for certain 
If the Legionnaires held a special unveiling ceremony where they had finished their work on the wall. But modern Bonnes wasn't going to miss the chance to commemorate the new Bridgenet slab. This project has really been a labour of love for all those involved in it. And um, I was thinking, you know, the Community Council motto is Cinema 2, and I thought we should add another three words to that, never give up, because it's been a long ten years, let me tell you. Today, with the help of everyone involved, it has been realised. Perhaps we should ask the stonemason to add another inscription on the wall in the words that, if Emperor Antonius Pius himself was here, might say, Longo tempora adventum yam. A long time coming, but here now. And the result is absolutely spectacular. It's even better than the original, and you can see detail that it's harder to see on the, the older uh, copy. So I really hope that people will enjoy coming here to, to visit the slab and to find out more about the Antonine Wall, which of course runs from Bones all the way to Old Kilpatrick. It's my hope that projects like this will start and kick start interest in, in the Antonine Wall and will hopefully lead to more investment bringing tourists into the area. Well, as you can see, it's a really monumental piece of art. Um, it's nine feet long um, with a central inscription uh, which basically tells you um, who built the Antonine Wall, why the Antonine Wall was built. It's built by legionaries. Um, it's the largest Roman inscription in Northern Britain. You know, it is of national importance. So it's not just the local community who've done a magnificent job of reproducing it. Um, it's significant worldwide. Um, it marks the zenith of the Roman Empire um, at a time when they were constructing a frontier uh, which was at the cutting point of uh, technology. Um, the inscription itself, and I'm sure you can all read this, so if you follow it with me, Imperial Caesar Titus Aurelius Hadrianus Antoninus August and Pius, uh, the father of his country, Popatria, um, the second August legion, uh, made, that's the defecit, and it gives you the distance, which is approximately four miles, which is the distance from here to the, the River Avon. Um, so we know the legionaries themselves were constructing the wall. The wall itself survives for a single generation, um, but the tablet for show quite clearly that the intention was that it would be here forever. You know, the, the whole construction of the Antonine Wall is so substantial um, this is one of a series of tablets found along the Antonine Wall. Uh, the other ones are much, much smaller than this one. Um, and they all show the degree of monumentality and the, the kind of mental thinking that the Romans had at the time, that this was a monument worth commemorating in stone, so that in almost 2,000 years, we'd be here today looking at them again. Um, and it, it, it's, it's great art as well, because you have a wonderful pelter here with griffin heads uh, on the ends of them. You know, so you've got imperial art, you've got provincial art, and you've got propaganda. And that's why we're here today, of course. Because from the propaganda point of view, it puts Bridgeness on the map. Look on the other side, and you'll see the map. We're right on the end of it, or right on the beginning of it. So hopefully this is the beginning of something new uh, that, that's going to take part in the next 10, 20 years. The Antonine Wall is a World Heritage Site. It's worth promoting. Thank you. I'd now like to hand this stone over to the people of Bones and ask them to keep it like it is and enjoy it. And I hope it brings lots of people to your town. Thank you. Bridgeness Slab is home, and you'd be hard pressed to tell the replica stone from the original. The project had cost about £75,000. So, do local people think it was worth it? Well, I think it's very impressive. It's been extremely well done. I have some knowledge of making replicas in stone, and 
Up till about 10 or 15 years ago, it was very difficult to do what has been done here. The advance of the technology in terms of uh, work with lasers and the undercutting that's been done has uh, made this stone much, much more successful than I would have thought possible. And uh, we actually have a replica here, which is probably got more detail on it than the one in the museum. So uh, it, it couldn't have been better. A mixture of exhilaration and deep satisfaction. Uh, exciting to see what is really a great icon of Scottish uh, Roman history that we've forgotten about, the bridge and slab. And a deep satisfaction that at long last we've got it out in public and raised the awareness to see a classic icon of Roman archaeology in Scotland put forward like this is excellent. Well, I think it's tremendous for the area and tremendous for the town. It's an asset that we've had for years, but there was never a focal point to describe the Antonine Wall in Bonnes other than a wee plaque down the road there. Now that we've got this, it's just tremendous for the area and the town. I think it's absolutely fabulous. It's um it's wonderful. I can't really describe the feeling um, of actually going up to Tradstock and seeing the big slab and then um, the figures actually coming to life. I don't think it's just a stone. I think it's one of the best Roman relics in, in Britain and, uh, and it's been recreated and brought here to Bowness. And I, I think the response today shows you how important it is. It's uh, a real um, artefact from the Antonine Wall and it hopefully helps people understand a wee bit more about the wall and brings people to the area. Those of us who have spent uh, half a lifetime uh, with an interest in the local history of this area and in particular with those early days the, of the Roman occupation of central Scotland um, have always seen the bridge nest slab as a kind of symbol of the whole business. Um, it's a fa fabulous uh, object. It always seemed quite remote from us stuck in the museum in Edinburgh. We had to do with uh, reproductions uh, that were hardly satisfactory. And to have this magnificent specimen behind me on permanent display in the town, not very far away from where it was found, is an absolute marvellous achievement. In fact, I, looking back now over my 30 odd years of involvement, I think this must be the single greatest achievement of a community in relation to its local history that I've come across in my time. And now that the Mark of Rome is there once again for all to see, what is Jeff Bailey's verdict on the project? The stone looks absolutely magnificent and you can tell from the reaction of the local people that they think that the setting uh, and, and just the, the very ambiance of the stone is exactly what they wanted. It's a monument not only to the Roman Empire but to the ability of the local people to get behind a project and to introduce a piece of public art which the Romans would have been proud of. The legions have long gone, but Bones is proud to honour the men who helped shape our country and our history. The Mark of Rome lives on.